This season, Texas Tech is switching to all mobile ticketing. That's right. Season tickets, mini plans, and single game tickets for all Texas Tech football, men's basketball, women's basketball, and baseball events are now mobile. So what does this mean for you? Convenience. Because your tickets will be stored on your mobile device, you no longer need to worry about receiving or printing physical copies of your tickets. This new process eliminates the need to coordinate meeting times for ticket distribution by allowing you the flexibility of easily transferring your tickets from your mobile device to the personal device of friends or family. So arriving to the game at different times is no longer a problem. Eliminating the cost of printing physical tickets allows us to put more resources into enhancing both the student athlete and fan experience. Prior to arriving to the stadium on game day, be sure to check your Apple Passbook or Google Pay and confirm tickets have been added. On game days, all you'll need is your phone, your physical parking pass, and of course, that Raider Power Spirit. If you have any questions, feel free to contact support in the Texas Tech Ticket Office at 806-742-TECH or visit texastech.com slash mobile ticketing. It's typical tech. Typical tech. It's a touchdown, Red Raider. Fantastic. Love it and leave it. And they hit on from Love it, Texas. That's pure Texas Tech. Hello and welcome to another episode of Typical Tech. My name is Robert Giovanetti, your host, and glad you could join us. Hope everyone had a great uh, Father's Day. We've got an outstanding podcast for you today. We're going to hear from Texas Tech football coach Matt Wells. Second time Coach Wells has been a guest here on the podcast. And also we're going to hear from A.J. Ramos, Red Raider great, who is now a uh, big league pitcher. He's pitched seven years in the big leagues, has 99 career saves. He's trying to catch on with a, a team after coming back from an injury need to play baseball. So we'll hear from AJ, uh, who is out in Florida. We have a typical tech uh, trivia question for you today, as this is the uh, second last week of June. We're just in the start of summer. On June 23rd, 1972, it was an important moment in college athletics. What is the anniversary that we celebrate every June 23rd? Be the 48th anniversary here uh, this week. And if you can uh, get that, you've got our typical tech a trivia question uh, correct. But we're going to start with everyone wants to know, are we going to play football? What's going on uh, with football as we've started now week two of uh, week three, actually. No, week two. Hard, math is hard sometimes. Week two of voluntary workouts. We've got the team back. Okay, we're now joined by the uh, very first guest ever on Typical Tech. Now having back again, Texas Tech head football coach, Matt Wells. And, and Matt, it's been an interesting uh, three months or so, hasn't it, since last time we talked back in uh, on this podcast back in March and April. Yeah, Gio, it's been, uh, seems like yesterday, seems like three years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's been some long days and it's, uh, you know, we're all dealing with this for the very first time in every, everybody's walk of life right now. And certainly ours in, in college football and with our players and our recruits, our incoming players, nothing, nothing looks the same. Um, the way we're training them, um, obviously very limited, um, backing up, you know, the signees coming in later in groups and our returning players and how we're able to, you know, communicate with them still virtually, which is great. I think we've been doing a great job of that, but it's still, there's something about in-person communication. I think we thrive on that, the relationships, uh, together. Uh, we just kind of finished our first week of voluntary workouts. Big 12 opened up everything for Monday went through a week of it. Um, it's still, you know, the kids are in the building, out the building, and everything is COVID-19 friendly or whatever you want to call it, protective. Because, you know, we have a tough job right now. Every one of us as coaches, our strength staff, our medical staff, Kirby, you know, because you, you, you're you trying to deal with all 120 players wherever stage they're in and uh, providing a safe, healthy environment in, in many areas for them. It is does that add a whole nother level? I mean, you've got you've got new guys coming in, you got guys still you know rehabbing, you've got guys that are veterans. Uh, is this where maybe the the veteran leadership maybe steps up a little bit? You always talk about hey, we get, we got to be a player led program. Yeah, you want that, but I mean the reality is 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 that's hard because even in this this week of voluntary workouts, the the the, the groups are condensed. Um, they can't hang out. We can't have position meetings. We can't have player meetings. We can't have team meetings in person. It's all still Zoom. So um, I think leadership is tougher that way. Um, and we're asking them to stay in small groups. 
We're not, you know, trying to be socially responsible or not being in big groups out and about all that kind of stuff that um, to be real frank with you, puts a damper on it. I mean, there's no two ways around it. We're not any different than anywhere else, but certainly at this stage in our program, we need that development. Um, we need that leadership. We need that peer to peer communication, player to player, if you will. Um, but uh, I think our, our guys have good attitudes about it. It's certainly tough, tough times um, in terms of that. But we also recognize the bigger picture, and we recognize that there's a lot of people in this world having tougher times, um, and we, we certainly recognize that and know that. But you asked a direct question on how it affects us. I'll try to answer it as best we can. Yeah, and, and so I do want to clarify all that, right? We do know there's sickness, and, and it's a tragic story and all that. We're just applying it to – to to our world in, in college athletics and I was gonna I talked to Kirby yesterday I said hey what's been the hardest thing for you during all this beyond again just the the human tragedy that we've seen and he said it's just the uncertainty right you don't it, every all this is unknown to us we don't know how to handle that for a coach you know coaches are very much always in control right how hard has that been for you guys to say man we don't know what next day is going to bring really hard sometimes it seems like a garden hose that uh, has all these uh, holes in it and you got two hands and two feet on two holes and then something else pops up uh, best analogy I can probably give you is I say this a lot you know in sports in athletics football you know we have to hit curveballs we have curveballs coming at us well I'm an old baseball player I know how to hit a curveball I know um, you know sit on the back foot you know, pick up the spin pick up that red dot angle your back drive that thing to right center if you're a right-handed hitter this thing's a knuckleball this thing's moving everywhere right now. And it really is. And you just, it's a moving target. You hear different things. There's different survey, not surveys, but there's different reports coming out from medical experts. Um, you know, now you've got three, four months of evidence, I guess three months, whatever, of evidence. And so um, what we thought was a few months ago, maybe not quite, um, you know, and we're dealing with it right now in this time in, in Lubbock where we're certainly on an uptick in Lubbock right now, but we weren't the first few months and we're just kind of uh, behind Dallas and Houston and Austin, bigger cities in Texas. But, um, you know, you gotta, we got to find ways to live with this and live through it and protect our kids, protect our families, um, be smart, social distancing. Um, as much as we don't like it, we, I think it's, it's still uh, prevalent. We need to do it. Got to wear masks too, right? We do. We ought to wear masks when we're out. And uh, I have mine off. I'm door shut though, right here, Gio. Mine too. Look, I've got mine right here. I'm ready to go. That's, uh, get, always, always at the ready. If anybody walks in, I'm ready. Hey, you guys are grinders, and you've been gr and you always grind as recruiting. Got great news uh, with Shadarius Townsend out of Alabama. Uh, tell us a little bit about him and where you see him fitting in with with your group here. Yeah, happy to announce. You know, Shadarius, he's a uh, very, very athletic, crazy athletic kid. Um, Highly recruited out of high school, Alabama high school, certainly coming from the University of Alabama, graduated in three years. He's played receiver, he's played DB, um, he's played running back, so not a ton of experience at running back. High school option quarterback, very physical and an elite speed uh, guy with the ball in his hands. And we're going to play him at running back. Um, we'll bring him in. Um, you know, he and Sir Roderick Thompson and certainly some of the other guys in that room, um, I think that's going to help our depth issues right there and you know I, I look for um, him and Sir Roderick they'll be a good combination um, and I think uh, Tech fans will really like CT he's a uh, he's electric with the ball in his hands. Hey I want to go football for a minute and again you talk about just the the real world situation with the virus but also last week we've also got another real world situation happening uh, in this country with racial uh, prejudice and social injustice and last week was Juneteenth and then also you, your team participated in a walk with with several others from the athletic department uh, on the east side of, of Lubbock and a peace walk um, what was that like for you and your guys how proud are you to see your guys out there everyone masked up and, and being a part of this community yeah we were you I was really proud of them they're really taking steps in the right direction I think we all are we're all learning um, it was an honor for me to be there to support them. They wanted me and the coaches to be with them and stand right next to them, and, and we certainly did. Uh, I support my guys. Tech athletics, I support in you know, all the things that Kirby and his staff have done. 
uh, the east side of Lubbock, our Lubbock community. Um, unity is important. Um, you know, togetherness, uh, racial equality, black lives do matter. They equally matter 100%. And, um, you know, I think while I have not worked, walked in, in many of those shoes, the ability to listen, to learn, to understand, um, I believe we can all educate ourselves and, and do that. But, you know, I'm just looking at, you know, one of our core values is respect and care for my teammates. And as we do that as people and as teammates, you learn more about your teammates. And I certainly think that uh, we can all be a part of positive change. Hey, we had a couple weeks ago a, a real powerful, I thought, staff call with all of our department led by Kirby. We were all on a Zoom call. One time, 151 people on there. You, you spoke up and, and talked on that. But um, what does that say about Texas Tech? I imagine that, that kind of thing is not happening in a lot of places where Kirby kind of took this thing head on and, and wanted to hear from people of, about their story. And I thought it was a pretty powerful meeting. You know, the thing that sticks out to me when you ask me about that is, is I think Coach Robinson, our track coach, um, said it. Kirby, Kirby's been doing this long before the last couple months. That spoke volumes to me only being here for a year and a half. Um, whether it's Kirby and his team, um, the Leadership Academy, um, all the other committees that we have to deal with uh, these types of issues and, and concerns. Sounds like to me Kirby's been ahead of the curve. Um, it's certainly an environment, an athletics environment, a staff environment, and hopefully we create that in each one of our teams that, that um, our kids are equal and they're very much supported. Um, and every kid does matter no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like. And I think that's certainly an endearing quality um, that we at Tech have, but I think you got to continue to feed it, um, learn, educate. Um, and you just, it's not a one time deal. It's not a one time Zoom call. It's not a one time peace walk. It's, I think it's got to continually be a part of our discussions. If you, as you know, you're a parent and you, you think about this when you deal with the other parents, you want to send your kid, no matter what, what the home situation is like, to a place you know they're going to feel comfortable and be taken care of. And, and obviously that's a, something that they know and you can see with your staff and hear from people on your staff that that, that is important to you guys as well. Uh, it is. It's, it's important for us to create that environment over here in football. And so our football players, their parents, they know that, but they feel it. Uh, we're not perfect never act like we will, but um, we just wrap our arms around them. And I do think that we're very active in their lives and we're active in communication and um, no, nobody's perfect. Um, but that's certainly the environment we want to create. I want to create just as if Wyatt Wells was playing in this program. And it's not just from, from those issues, it's the coronavirus and the COVID-19 and the things we're doing to try to keep our kids safe. Uh, provide a weight room and an atmosphere that is completely clean and healthy and as best we can. I, I certainly think that um, Kirby supports um, all of athletics, certainly football in both of those areas. And, it, and he, I, I believe he does it at a high level. Hey, I know you got Wyatt's back playing baseball again. Uh, how much is this driven home to all of us, you in particular and others, how much we need sports and, and miss sports and glad to have it back. Yeah, I'm, I'm biased. I'm biased as a coach, um, as a former athlete, as, you know, many of us that are affected by sports. I think we need it. I'm, I'm not bashful about saying it. I think we need college football. And I got no clue, to be honest with you, and I'm not being negative about it. I'm just – I have no idea what it's going to look like. Uh, anybody that says less is they're, – they're full of it is what they are because nobody can predict it. It's a knuckleball right now, Gio, um, but we need it. Um, and hopefully we can and figure out a way to continue to do it. And I hope that's the case for our players, for uh, fans, for, for tech fans and boosters and uh, just all of us, really. But more than the players, or excuse me, more than the fans and the boosters, the players, they're the ones that need it. You know, that's – but we got to do it in a safe environment, in a healthy environment, and uh, those are the environments we want all of our children to be in. Yeah, that's why I always tell people when the mass debate comes up, and sometimes it, people politicize it, right? And I said, hey, the only politics I'm thinking about is a safe environment so we can play football at Jones Stadium in September. And so hopefully everyone gets on board with that. Well, we're all responsible for the football season. The city of Lubbock is, okay? 
our football team, our coaches. That's all I keep talking to our guys about is they ought to wear masks. We ought to do this, small groups, um, and, and being, being smart that way. And certainly in these workplaces that we're, we're back to work now and, you know, masks and our guys that are voluntarily lifting right now, they're wearing masks. You know, all our coaches, all the athletic department people. So I just think we all play a part in being responsible for having a football season. Hey, how uh, happy was, A, were you to get back to the office? And was, was Jen as happy to get you out of the house a little bit and get you back to the office? Yeah, I'm happy. She was elated. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, that was a long three months or whatever. We, yeah, we were in there about three months. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we – Nothing really changed. I told you that on the last call. I mean, we were up early working through the day from recruiting to our player relationships to FaceTimes to to Zooms um, to game planning. Um, We've just resumed it in here, socially distanced. We stayed out of the staff rooms. We're spaced out in the team room, uh, wearing masks and all that. But, but yeah, that's that's better. But I think there were some wives trying to put the coaches in the transfer portal a little bit (laughs) after a while and wanted us out of there all right well I hope that uh, you uh, can stay healthy in the next couple months and hopefully we will see you on September 5th in El Paso playing football thanks Gio all my best to you uh, Red Raider Nation out there continue to stay safe and stay healthy keep supporting Texas Tech football we thank you for what everybody does all right, well, thanks Wreck them. Jayford Roofing Pro Knowing that your communities have turned to J. Ferg Roofing Pros to roof your schools, churches, and hospitals, you'll find comfort at home living under a J. Ferg roof. If you want a quality roof from a local company who will be here after the storm chasers are gone, call J. Ferg Roofing Pros today. Don't just get a roof, choose a J. Ferg roof. The best solution for your business or your home. J. Ferg Roofing Pros. All right, now we're pleased to be joined by a former Red Raider great seven-year career in the big leagues. Hopefully, get back to playing and he can add an eighth to it. A.J. Ramos, uh, love it, boy. A- A.J., what's going on there? I know you're uh, you're out in Florida. What have you been doing? I've been uh, working out, finally on the mound. Um, been throwing bullpens, and I think last week uh, was the first week that I threw the hitters for the first time in two and a half years. And wow. uh, it was exciting. Yeah, it was exciting. I, uh, it went well. I mean, the uh, ball was coming out good. The hitters were not seeing it. Um, had the feeling of striking out guys again and, and having that, that, that good feel again. So uh, it's going good, man. Finally, it's been a long, long process, but uh, I'm making my way. You know, you and I were talking earlier, you're out in Florida where there's been a, a lot of COVID cases. Is it something that that you see every day? Are you having to stay uh, isolated from a lot of people? I mean, I've been, I've been isolated from a lot of people ever since this process happened. I've been focused on trying to get back. Um, all I've been doing since surgery is, is uh, going to rehab, then going to the gym, then going to the store to get something to eat or get something to make to eat, and then going home. So I've been, I've been in quarantine life for like two years now. So <laughs> whenever the quarantine hit, uh, it was – it was business as usual for me. Um, I've been fully focused. It takes, it takes all the focus to get back. Uh, it's just been a, a really, really grueling process. But uh, like I said, I'm finally starting to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I, I was talking to somebody earlier today about you, and I told him the first year I started doing tech play-by-play, you got hurt. And I remember you didn't tell anybody for a, a long time. And right? then you had to have the Tommy John. And that's usually a long process, but – you fought through it and you were back the, the, the next year. Looking back on that, has that helped you in your – just that mentality you have that you're able to kind of fight through some of these injuries and come back? 100%. Um, you know, getting back so quickly, I got back, I think I was pitching in games in 10 months after that surgery. Yeah. Um, so that mentality is good for, you know, getting back and, and getting through tough tough spots. But at the same time, it hurts, hurts me because it did take a full year for me to – tell somebody that I was hurt and then my I didn't it, it was all the way up until my play started to suffer when I started to say something and it was no different this time I hurt myself in 2014 and uh, they gave me a cortisone shot and then from there for about two years I didn't feel it and then after at the end of 16 season the start of 17 I started to feel it almost every day and then at the beginning of the 18 spring training it just was hurting like at a level seven or eight and uh, so then finally 
it took for me to walk the bases loaded and then walk the run in to lose the game in Milwaukee for me to say something about my arm. And finally they went in there and they, they saw that it was torn and they were like, uh, we, we don't know how you were throwing as hard as you were throwing and uh, how you were able to throw through that pain. It's, it's amazing that you did that. And I was like, well, that's cool. But I, I caused a lot of losses in some games. <laughs> so again, it's, it's a good, it's a good thing to have that mentality, but also you have to be able to separate yourself and, and also, listen to your body. So I think that's what this experience has taught me is to keep that mentality, but also be able to understand that when your body's telling you something to listen to it and, and to kind of take care of it right then and there instead of letting it get so bad. Uh, timing, there's never a good time, right, to get hurt, but you really had it going on by the time you got hurt, didn't you? Yeah, I was rolling, man. I was, it was an all-star season, um, 2016. I was starting to get my groove and then just that pain. It's funny how, how pain alters your mechanics. I, I started to look at some of the things that I was doing and, and my arm consistent was never, my arm uh, path was never consistent. And uh, it's hard to do that, you know, and while pitching, I can remember just thinking, how can I throw this ball without pain? And when you're doing that against some of the best hitters in the world, I mean, you're up against a, a pretty tough task already and you add that into it. Battling yourself is never good. So um, that's something that I, that now when I'm throwing the hitters now, it feels good because I'm just focusing on trying to get the guy out. I'm not worried about trying to manipulate a, my arm movement to throw a pitch. And it just feels like throwing right now is very, very easy. You know, I don't, it didn't take a lot of mental strength right now because, you know, before I had so much to think about now, it's just like, all right, get the ball to the glove. So it's a, it's definitely a relieving feeling to have. So if we can ever get baseball back, you feel like you're ready. 100%. Um, you know, I'm just waiting on the word of if there's going to be a season or not to kind of make my next move. Um, if there's going to be a season, then here in the next 10 to 12 days, I'll probably call some scouts and, and, and uh, or send some video out and just kind of show them that I'm ready. Um, if there's not a season, um, then I change my plans a little bit and see where I, where I am, how I'm feeling, and maybe try to uh, – if it's if it's uh, allowed or if it's possible, maybe try to throw in front of scouts still, and maybe try to get signed early so that I'm going into next year ready for spring training with the team instead of trying to find a job um, in spring training. So uh, it's kind of uh, up in the air, just like everyone else. It's just kind of sit and wait and try to be as prepared as possible right now. How are they communicating with you guys? How are you getting the information about what's happening? Well, me, because I'm I'm so out of the loop. You know, I have my agent still, so I, I get on calls with him. And, uh, but for the most part, it's other guys here in Jupiter. I mean, um, there's, Ju there's Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, which is, you know, the, the head player rep. So I get a lot of info from him. And I've, there's like five or six other major league guys here that are working out in the same facility as me. Um, so you just kind of talking to those guys is how I'm getting my information. And just like everyone else looking at Twitter, um, <laughs> there's a lot of news on there, man. So uh, I got to stay up updated that way because I'm not getting the, the emails anymore like I used to. Um, I mean, it's been two years. So uh, that's why I'm staying um, in contact with that, which is good because it gives me enough space to kind of worry about what I need to worry about first. Because if, you know, if I'm not good enough to play, it doesn't matter <laughs> what, if there's a season or not. So uh, focusing on that and going from there. You, you know, it, it, you've got a great story because you're not a big guy and usually right handers that are your size, a lot of times don't even get a sniff, right? But you, you were an all-star in a major league level. Growing up, yeah. those dreams you had? Yeah, man. I mean, it's just uh, – it, it's pretty cool to think about, you know, especially during the time when uh, – this past summer where, you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to play last year. Um, kind of reflecting on my career and, and uh, acknowledging some of the things that I was able to do, um, it's pretty cool to look back at. But, you, you know, while you're in it, it's hard to look at that and enjoy it because you're trying to make sure that you're competing day in, day out. And if you're sitting there kind of thinking about, man, I did good so far, you're, you know, it's not, it's not a good thing to think about when you're trying to get some of the best hitters, hitters out in the world, you know? So, uh, um, but you know, during this time I've had time to reflect and I'll watch some videos of me pitching and, uh, and I'm just like, Oh man, look at that pitch. That's nasty. You know, kind of pumping myself up like, man, that was me. Look at me, look at me go, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, then I'm throwing some pitches now and feeling that same feeling and, and getting reactions that I used to get from hitters, you know, when they're missing it by a lot. I'm like, there it is. There's that feeling. I get chills thinking about it, man, because it's been a long time to be able to feel that. That's, 
I've been doing that since I was five years old, man. So um, being able to do that um, again and have that feeling is just something that reminded me of a part of myself that I had forgotten. And then honestly, that I didn't think I'd ever get back. So, Do you remember your, you remember your first big league appearance? Do you remember who you faced? Yeah, yeah, I, I remember. Uh, I remember I couldn't feel my legs when I was running in from the bullpen. I remember this this over stimulation of, uh, of feelings and emotions and 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 senses. You know, it's just over stimulation and and to be able to kind of rein it in was pretty cool. I faced uh, Ricky Weeks, uh, Ryan Braun, and Aramis Ramirez is who I faced. Okay, and, uh, struck all three of them out. So <laughs> <laughs> was that at home? Was that at home? Was that in Milwaukee? That was in um, that was in Miami, Miami. Um, okay, good. Yeah. So, who who's the toughest batter you've ever faced? Who's the toughest out? Uh, for me, uh, well, I mean Daniel Murphy. Um, he was always tough. Uh, he was always a, you know a, a six plus pitch at bat for me. You know, I'd get two strikes on him, and then he'd foul some stuff off, and you know he would he would take some good pitches that were just outside of the zone and kind of do that. Um. Faced uh, David Ortiz. I only faced him once, but you can tell, I mean, his reactions of the way I was throwing my pitches, they were very, he was taking them well. Like he's like, he was seeing them very good, you know, and it was pretty cool to kind of see that. Got him out. But uh, I, I think another tough at bat who I didn't get to face um, was Barry Bonds. He stood in, well, I was, I was hurt and I was uh, throwing a, um, a bullpen and he wanted to step in and kind of give me some feedback. And he was calling pitches out of my hand if they were going to be a strike or a ball. So I threw like a fastball and it was halfway out of my, you know, halfway to the plate. He'd say fastball, ball. And it was a fastball for a ball. And I was like, man, he's recognizing pitches out of my hand. So his, his ability to see the ball was amazing. And um, I think he, he would have been probably the toughest at bat I would have faced. Um, hey, and, and you used to live with the guys pretty good. John Carl, John Carl Stanton, right? He's yeah. pretty good. He, that guy can play a little bit. Man, you know, like if you if I would make a mistake, he'd for sure make it go a long way. Um, <laughs> you know, but I like facing guys who can hit the ball a long way because that's that's their that's their default. You know, that's that's where you can get them. You know, they're trying to hit the ball a long way, so that leaves holes. So I'm never afraid to face guys like that. It's the guys who are like sitting back and slapping balls the other way or just hitting ball where it's pitched are the ones that are, are pretty tough. Although when John Carlo does that. You know, when he's just slapping the ball the other way, balls still go out. So whenever he's in that zone, uh, he would be a very, very tough at bat for sure. Hey, uh, you you didn't play for uh, Tadlock. You you were here for Coach Hayes and Coach Spencer, but Tadlock recruited you, though, didn't he, on the junior college level? Do you, you remember that at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I was excited, you know, because Grayson, he was at Grayson Junior College at that point. And, you know, they, they were winning championship, championship, you know, and they were always putting up good good teams. Um, so I went there and visited with him and, uh, uh, his sales pitch was great, you know, and, and his, his record was great. The only, one of the only reasons I didn't want to go there is because his weight room, I remember his weight room was like a bow flex, you know, and I was like, man, I, I'm a, I'm a little guy. I need to get as strong as possible, you know, and I don't know if I, that can quite get me as strong as I need to be. Although it might've been, it was, he was doing something right and he's still doing something right, man. It's amazing to see him, um, just turn this program the way it is. And it's just exciting to kind of just always watch the guys or just keep up with them and, and be excited and tell everybody in the locker room or whoever I'm, wherever I'm at, like, Hey, yeah, that, that's, that's my team, you know? So he's done a lot of great for the program. And he's an awesome guy, amazing guy. And he cares about his, his players and, and, and his program. Um, you know, he's one of the best in the business for sure. I kind of remember you when you were here, like you love to, you were, you hit the weight room pretty hard. So both flex probably wouldn't work for you. No, no, it wouldn't have worked for me, man. I don't think so. I think there wasn't enough weight on there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I was going to say, though, you come back a lot. You come back to Lubbock. How, how important is your roots and your home here to you? Oh, it's important. Uh, I go back every year, and I was there during the quarantine um, when it first kind of started because I was here in Florida before that, and they closed down all the parks and all the gyms and stuff like that. So I went home and uh, have a gym at the house. So I went there and worked out. Um, and just hung out with family. Um, the summer before that, I was, uh, it was my first, was it nine months out of surgery? I was doing really well. Then I got a bone bruise and it, that set me back nine months. But the turning point for me that got me over that is whenever I 
because I was in Florida for that whole time. And then I came back to, to Lubbock and I was just hanging around family and just being in Lubbock and getting that feel of whenever I was in high school and just the, my roots and up, upbringing from Lubbock, it kind of got me over that, that tough time. You know, I was, I was home just being AJ, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, a former baseball player, whatever it is. I was just with my parents and my family and they're just giving me unconditional love. And that's, that's the thing that really was a turning point in this whole process. Cause before that, I didn't think I was going to come back, man. I mean, I had video of myself throwing and I'm like, God, look how, I mean, I just remember all the pain that I felt and how awful it looked. It looked like I was throwing with the wrong hand and, and which is part of the process. But before that, before I got that bone bruise, I was throwing and it looked like I never left. Like everyone was like, you had surgery nine months ago? And I was like, yeah, I was kind of on that same process I was uh, as coming back in 10 months from my Tommy John, you know, I was just way ahead. And then I pushed it too hard. You know, I didn't have youth on my side at that point. I'm 33 years old, 32 years old at the time. And, you know, that kind of caught up to me. I wasn't listening to things and, you know, I went too hard and got that bone bruise. And then uh, that set me back. But again, going home, to Lubbock, just being around the, the, an area that I'm very familiar with and I love uh, helped me get out of that. And uh, now, you know, I'm way, I'm leaps and bounds of, of above where I was before. And I'm looking forward to, to kind of putting it all together and pitching this season. If there's, yeah, do you have, do you have guessed where you might end up? Anybody that you've had more talks with than others that you can talk about? Um, No, I mean, um, there's been a, a lot of guys or a lot of GMs reaching out to my agent. Um, I, uh, was it last Friday I faced Goldschmidt and uh, Paul Goldschmidt, he was, he was with the uh, Cardinals. And, uh, you know, after I was done, I kind of asked him like, so what is that? What was that like compared to the other times you faced me? He said, that was good. Do you want to play with the cards? <laughs> I said, I said, sure. I'll, I want to play with a team that's going, you know, deep into the playoffs and has a chance to win the world series. And I said, you guys have a pretty good squad and you guys can go deep. He's like, yeah, I'll make a, you know, I'll make a call to my GM or whatever, but, you know, with how things are going right now. I mean, it's just, it's tough to know like what, where the owners are and, and they're in the process of signing when we don't even have teams. So it's, everything's kind of up in the air. So. So is, if you look back on all the, the that you've overcome, is your drive still like it is? Is there a time that AJ Ramos can say, okay, I've had enough? No, no, man. There's, <laughs> I, ha I still have to tell myself, Hey, that's enough. I mean, Earlier, I just went to work out and I came back to my hotel room and I saw some resistance bands on my bed. And I was like, I'll do a couple more sets here. And then I said, like, hey, and then I remember that I had an interview. So you helped me kind of rein it in on that part. So, so thank you for, for that. Man, what I can do to help. When you get yeah. to safe number 100, you know, maybe you'll send a signed ball or something with that. To that. Okay, you, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm 90. one away. I'm one away, man. <laughs> Yeah, you can't end at 99 career saves. You have to have at least one more, right? Oh, man, I, I got a lot more. I got a lot more saves in me. Um, that's just the, the little, what, milestone or whatever. And from there, you know, we'll see how many I can get. I, I have a lot more left in me. Uh, I'm feeling good. This is the best I've felt in a long, long time in years, probably since 2016, you know. So um, I'm looking forward to being out there and, and getting some more saves and sending some save balls your way. <laughs> so you're you're in a hotel right now? Yeah, I'm in a hotel in Jupiter. Okay, good. I was gonna say, man, AJ, your art taste in art is not great, but now that I know you're in a hotel, I feel <laughs> I feel better about that. I thought you yeah, were like, no, no, that's uh, uh, no, that's not my art, man. I wouldn't buy that. <laughs> hey, we're all so proud of you, man. It's great to watch. We're gonna be uh, hoping to get back to playing baseball and get to see you pitch again in the big leagues. Hey, man, it was it was fun, man. It's good seeing you as always. Uh, you know, it's always a good time. And uh, see, I, you're looking good, man. You, this quarantine has treated you well. <laughs> All right, man. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Good luck. All right, man. Thanks. Man, if A.J. Ramos is not typical tech, I don't know what is. What a great guy. Has been that way uh, ever since I first met him so many years ago. Uh, good luck to A.J. and his rehab and getting uh, the season uh, back on track. Uh, had the trivia question earlier in the podcast, 1972, June 23rd, 1972. What happened on that date? That was when Title IX passed. We are celebrating the 48th anniversary now of Title IX. Check out the video we've got on social media uh, that shows and highlights all of our fantastic women's sports programs. And remember, the first ever national championship here at Texas Tech back in 1993, the Texas Tech Lady Raider uh, basketball team. Thanks for being with us here on the Texas Tech Athletics podcast channel. You can like, subscribe, give us five-star rating. 
Don't miss Scarlet and Black with Hacks. That releases every week as well. Jeff Haxton always has uh, some great things going on there on his podcast. Thanks again to Matt Wells and to A.J. Ramos. And as we finish up, you know, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, NASA and how Texas Tech is leading the way with NASA. How about this? We announced this week we're going to digital paperless tickets this year, uh, starting with football, but that'll go across our sports that are ticketed events. Again, it's a new era here. We're excited about what that's going to do. We've got lots of great videos out there showing you uh, how it works, what you can expect. Got your frequently asked questions as well if you go to texastech.com. We're very excited about it. We think it's a great step forward, and that is typical tech. Thanks again to Matt Wells. Thanks again, AJ Ramos. I'm Robert Giovanetti. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll talk to you next time. It's typical tech. Typical tech. It's a touchdown, Red Raider. Fantastic. Love it and leave it. And they hail from Lubbock, Texas. That's pure Texas tech. This season, Texas Tech is switching to all mobile ticketing. That's right. Season tickets, mini plans, and single game tickets for all Texas Tech football, men's basketball, women's basketball, and baseball events are now mobile. So what does this mean for you? Convenience. Because your tickets will be stored on your mobile device, you no longer need to worry about receiving or printing physical copies of your tickets. This new process eliminates the need to coordinate meeting times for ticket distribution by allowing you the flexibility of easily transferring your tickets from your mobile device to the personal device of friends or family. So arriving to the game at different times is no longer a problem. Eliminating the cost of printing physical tickets allows us to put more resources into enhancing both the student athlete and fan experience. Prior to arriving to the stadium on game day, be sure to check your Apple Passbook or Google Pay and confirm tickets have been added. On game days, all you'll need is your phone, your physical parking pass, and of course, that Raider Power Spirit. If you have any questions, feel free to contact support in the Texas Tech Ticket Office at 806-742-TECH or visit texastech.com slash mobile ticketing.